All right, so last night we were drinking this bottle, uh, Queen of this Queen of the Sierra. What is this called? Forlorn Hope. Forlorn Hope 2019 is state amber wine from Rorick Heritage Vineyard in Calaveras County. It's an orange wine. It's like a hipster wine. People have been making orange wines for thousands of years, but I guess they became pretty big in the last couple of years. Yeah, I like it. It's it's surprising. It's tasty. I think it's a fun, pleasant winter wine. What I was thinking we would do is we would describe this wine to you in the best way that we can. Afterwards, we're going to see how other people who know a lot more about wine than us have described this wine. Ching ching. I get grapefruit. So the smell is fruity. I was gonna say just citrus broadly. I, I can smell the gra grapefruit. I also smell orange and a note of bitter almond. Maybe a little bit of cherry. Oh, barnyard. Do you get barnyard? No. I get a little bit of barnyard. No barnyard? The flavor is a little earthier. It, it tastes maybe like a hay. composting pile hay. of hay. I get yeah. hay. Okay, we get hay and citrus. I get like a, like an iron aftertaste, like a minerally water or soil. Yeah, this smells like a New York City fruit vendor on the outside. With the rotten wood a little bit, little of, bit. The, of, the, of the fruit crates. We've got New York City fruit vendor, rotten wood. Citrus. Definitely hay. Can you smell the almond and cherry or is it just me? For sure, almost like an amaretto. Amaretto is a little Italian cookie made from ground bitter almond and I think egg whites and sugar that come in a, in a little shape, they're hard and spongy. I like it. It's it, you, you, you can taste it, the different layers. They're not so smoothly combined, which is good and bad. Let's see what the professionals say. The wine hipsters love it. Ending the working week with a nice amber wine from California. A blend of Verdelo, Aparino, Muscat, and Chardonnay with four months skin contact. Slightly cloudy, pale orange color. Clean, youthful, medium plus intensity. Nose of apricot, grapefruit, orange, pineapple, and wet slate. Dry, medium body, medium alcohol, and high acid. Medium plus intensity flavors of apricot, pineapple, and grape. God, this is long. Pineapple and grapefruit on the smooth palate, leading to a medium plus length mouth watering finish. Very good. Drink now or before 2025. People talk about white peach, cantaloupe, iced tea, uh, mango, peach, hibiscus, low acid. All right, one day when the pandemic is done, I think we should go to uh, for Lauren Hope, Queen of the Sierra and the Vineyards in California. Before 2025. Before 2025. All right, that's all for our wine tasting. And now we're going to get into uh, uppers and downers, booze and caffeine. Cheers. All right, cheers. Hey everyone, I'm Benjamin Siegel, and welcome back to Taste, Culture, and Power. And here's a little bit of a warning. This lecture is meant for those of you of legal drinking age in whatever state, country, or local jurisdiction you happen to be watching in. If you're not of age yet, please skip ahead to the next lecture. No, obviously, I'm kidding. There's no age limit here. But I am going to be spending the first half of our time together talking about alcohol, one of human beings' great pleasures, as well as a substance that can be fraught with danger, both at an individual level, but also at a social one. Then we're going to shift gears a bit and talk about another one of the great experiences of being human, artificial stimulation in the form of caffeine, which we ingest in a variety of ways, though not quite as wide as how we consume alcohol. Basically, these are the drugs that power our lives. And while there are other culturally important narcotic substances that we use in similar ways as food, everything from cannabis to cot to cocoa and yerba mate, these are the ones that have the greatest global reach. The odds are overwhelmingly good that within a few hours, or in my case a couple of minutes, of getting up, you had some kind of caffeinated beverage. A cup of coffee, a cup of tea, maybe even something like a Red Bull or another energy drink. And some of you might end the day with an alcoholic drink, 
a cold beer or glass of wine at dinner, maybe a whiskey or something else afterwards. Over the next little bit, I'm going to give us some ways to think about these substances and their changing roles and impacts in human history. Let's start with alcohol which appears in many different forms, but which we're broadly going to divide into wine, beer, and distilled spirits. Alcohol is a substance like many others that we take into our body, but it not only affects our body, but our mind as well. When we have just a small amount of alcohol in our body, we can feel a lot of different emotions, happiness, sadness, anger, lust, with a little greater freedom and greater intensity. Keep going, ingest a little more alcohol, and you've got a potent narcotic on your hands. Your feelings are numbed, your thoughts are clouded, and eventually you may lose consciousness itself. Since the beginning of recorded history, humans have made use of that property of alcohol to liberate themselves from their usual and more controlled states of mind. At the basic molecular level, we can thank microscopic yeasts for wine, beer, and spirits. These yeasts appear absolutely everywhere. They're floating around us, they're on our skin, they're in the air and they're responsible for everything that we enjoy that's fermented, things like kimchi or pickles. They break down food sugars and they turn them into alcohol. Yeasts make use of their capacity to produce alcohol as an evolutionary advantage to protect themselves against competition from other microbes. They basically eat up sugar and excrete alcohol as their byproduct. Alcohol is toxic to all living cells, including to yeast cells, but many species can tolerate at least a little bit of alcohol. When you feel a little bit of a buzz having a drink, that's a sign that yeasts have disrupted the normal functioning of your brain. But yeasts also have other qualities that actively transform the way that substances smell and taste. As they ferment a given sugar, yeasts produce other amino acids. They bring out fruity notes and they hide other notes. They can hint at the smell of coffee or vegetables, toast, lots of other things. They can also make things more nutritious. Yeasts can take fruit juice or cereal mash and synthesize new proteins and B vitamins from their sugars. So fermented drinks can take on nutritional qualities that the original product didn't even have. But beyond those chemical qualities, there's the work of a winemaker or a brewer or a distiller, and that's the work of human culture and genius. Any one of these culinary artists take wild yeasts and put them in his or her service, creating something that's beautiful and often delicious. You can make cheap wines and cheap beers and cheap spirits, and certainly a lot of what we drink around the world is pretty cheap and uninteresting. But you can also create flavors that are among the most sublime that humans can offer. Whether it's a Brunello de Montalcino from Tuscany, a juicy IPA from Treehouse in Charlton, Massachusetts, or a, a Petey Ardberg Scotch, these are among humankind's most impressive creations. If you're someone who likes alcohol, you probably didn't immediately like it. Wine, beer, and distilled spirits are all bracing to drink, and they're almost the epitome of an acquired taste. But over time, you learn to pick out the qualities in a drink that make it enjoyable. You can also learn to appreciate the more ineffable ways in which flavor is produced from a place and its traditions, from certain plants and soils, the quality of a year and the weather that it had, even the souls of the humans who made it. So let's do a quick play-by-play -play here. When you think of wine, you almost assuredly picture fermented grape juice. But grapes are only one of the countless sweet liquids that you can ferment into something we think of as wine. Anything with a little sugar can be fermented. One of the oldest wine-like drinks in the world is called hummus, and it's made from fermented horse's milk in Central Asia. It's still produced today. Many ancient peoples used to ferment a mix of honey and water, and they called it mead. Ancient Romans drank grape wine, but also date wine and fig wine. And you could ferment apple juice, of course, and many Europeans did that and called it cider. And we sometimes speak of the rice wine traditions from East Asia, like Korean sochu or Japanese sake, even if those are arguably closer to a beer. But it's really grapes that are the stars of the show in the wine world, since the grape is uniquely suited to production as wine. It can be grown productively in different soils and in different climates. Grapes also have a ton of sugar in them, so yeasts have a lot to eat. They produce a ton of alcohol, and that can strip out other microbes. Grapes also have a great deal of natural variety, so you can make them even more diverse when you get around to fermenting them. In the modern world, grapes are by far and away the world's most popular fruit crop, and around 70% of all grapes produced are used to make wine. 
Winemaking is often talked about in complicated ways, but the process is really simple. You take ripe grapes, you crush them, and release their juices. Then you let the grape juice ferment by letting those sugar-consuming and alcohol-producing yeasts just go to town. And you get something that we would think of as a new wine. Then you take that fresh wine and you age or mature it. You let the chemical constituents of the grape react with each other and with oxygen to make a new and more stable body of molecules. Those are the basics, but winemaking is an art, and you can spend a lifetime studying it and learning it. We of course distinguish in a broad sense between red and white wines, but we can also speak of orange wines, yellow wines, rosés, and many other broad categories. We also tend to name a wine based on both where it was grown and the type of grape that was used to produce it. Winemaking goes back to the beginning of time. The earliest firm record we have for the practice comes from western Iran, where archaeologists found residues of wine in the bottom of a pit from around 6,000 before the Common Era. Around 3,000 years after that, wine was being traded regularly across the Middle East. Almost all of the first wines were red, but white wine came in time as well. Wines would be fermented in clay jars, grated and labeled, and sealed with mud to age. Many Egyptian pharaohs were buried with their favorite vintages of wine. Winemaking then spread to Greece and Rome, where it played an important role in religious rites, beginning with the cult of Dionysus, the god of wine. By 700 before the Common Era, wine was a daily beverage in Greece. It was made very strong and then watered down, and freemen and slaves had different grades of wine allocated for drinking. It took the Italians until around 200 before the Common Era to really learn how to make wine, but over the next several centuries, Romans became standard bearers in wine making. They discovered the different qualities of soil that produced very different types of wine, and developed airtight amphora that allowed them to age wine for many years. Along with the Greeks, the Romans used to use tree resin, salt, and spices to flavor their wines. The biggest winemaking development, though, was that Romans learned how to use the wooden cask by taking that technology from Northern Europe, and wood casks became the standard vessel for wine. They were lighter and less fragile, so it was easier to ship them, but the downside was that they were also vulnerable to air. It would take another thousand years until the invention of the cork that helped create both good vintages and wines that could age well. Winemaking fell into a period of uncertainty after the fall of Rome, but monasteries helped to keep the tradition of winemaking alive. Since wine was required for Holy Communion, monks were invested in the production of wine even in bad conditions. Over time, the center of winemaking moved northwest into France, and the wines of France, particularly Bordeaux, became the country's most important export. Italian wine really lost out in this period, since political fragmentation in Italy meant that it couldn't put the power of the state behind its excellent local wines. Let's talk a little bit about beer. In some ways, it's a little more natural to have a drink made from grapes. Grapes had the advantage of natural sugars in them, while grains from starch need to be broken down a bit before they're turned into something useful to ferment. There are also some real advantages to using grain as well. Grain grows quicker and more productively than grapes do. It's more productive than a grapevine, and so you can store it for a very long time and then turn it into a drink at basically any time of the year, as opposed to grapes, which you can only make into wine at harvest time. But of course, the flavors of a fermented grain are really different than those of a fermented fruit. Beer making is an ancient art, just like winemaking. And there's a lot of different ways to break down a starch into something fermentable. Inca women used to chew down ground corn and break it down with the enzymes in their saliva to make an early type of beer. In East Asia, brewers learned how to use a mold found on rice, a spiragilius orze, and to use those enzymes to break down that grain into alcohol. In the Middle East, brewers just soaked grain in water, ground the grain, and then they heated it up a little bit. That process is called molting, and it's the foundation of all modern beer. By the third millennia before the Common Era, brewers in Egypt, Babylon, and Sumeria were making barley and wheat beers. The most common technique was just to take malted grain, bake it into a flatbread, and then soak it in water to get beer. Slowly, that technology moved through Western Europe and up to Northern Europe. Beer wasn't really popular in Greece and Rome. It was described there as kind of an unnatural invention, something you'd do if you couldn't find grapes. But in climates where it was too cold to grow grapes very well, beer took off instead. 
So it's kind of unsurprising that beer was and still remains the most popular drink in places like Germany or Belgium or England or the Netherlands. By the 9th century of the Common Era, ale houses were very common in England. And most keepers also brewed their own beer. It was considered a food, so it wasn't taxed. But it was in Germany that beer making was really raised into an art through two inventions. The first was the addition of hops, and the second was a new process of slow fermentation in the cold to help produce a new type of beer called lager. The addition of herbs and spices to beer wasn't anything new. That helped give beer flavor, and it prevented off flavors from other microbes. And in early modern Europe, lots of different herbs and spices were used. Things like bog myrtle, rosemary, yarrow, coriander, juniper, and sweet gale. But around 900, German brewers started using hops, which are these really small, resiny cones from a vine that's a cousin of cannabis. Hops had and still has a really good, distinct taste, and it also helped to prevent spoilage. And within a few centuries, it was standard to use hops in almost all beer production, except for in England, where it took until the 1700s. Brewers up until the 1400s continued to make beer without any real control over temperature. These big yeasts used to float on the top of the liquids that were used for beer making. Beer fermented quickly, and then it was meant to be drunk right away. But in the Bavarian Alps, brewers learned how to ferment in colder places like caves, aging the beer for longer periods. The result was then packed in ice and the yeast was skimmed off the top. And that beer was really light and clear and mild. At first, lagers were only found in Bavaria, but then the technique spread in the middle of the 19th century to places like Czechoslovakia, Denmark, and the United States, becoming the standard production for modern beers. There's nearly as much diversity in the world of beers as there is in the world of wine. England and Belgium continue to produce beer in a kind of old-fashioned way, at warmer temperatures and with yeasts that continue to form on top. In the 19th century, Britain also began to produce new types of beers pale malts and pale ales, as well as darker malts that produced beers like stouts and porter, which were much darker and heavier than any other kind of beer. Finally, a quick word about spirits. Distilled spirits are, putting it simply, a concentrated essence of a wine or beer. They take advantage of the chemical fact that different substances boil at different temperatures. So if you heat a mix of water and alcohol, the alcohol turns into steam first. If you collect that alcohol vapor and cool it down, you get a more concentrated form of alcohol than what was in the original substance. There's actually limits to the amount of alcohol that you can produce through natural fermentation. When you get to around 20% alcohol, yeast start to become toxic to themselves. So distillation gives you a way around that limitation. Distilled spirits, of course, are known for being strong but they're also intensely aromatic and flavorful, and whether it's whiskey or gin or something altogether different, spirits are valued for those diverse properties. The distillation of substances is very old. We know that this was practiced in Mesopotamia with aromatic plants more than 5,000 years ago. Aristotle wrote about how you could produce drinkable water from salty seawater through a process of early distillation but it was probably in China around 2,000 years ago that alcohol was distilled for the first time from grains like sorghum, making things that we'd recognize as baijiu today. And by the 13th century, there were a lot of commercial spirits being sold in China. In the European context, it was probably in Italy that alcohol was first produced as a drug at the medical school in Salerno. Spirits soon became known as aqua vitae, the water of life. And you still hear this term in a lot of European languages from aquavit in Scandinavian to eau de vie in French. Whiskey comes from the Gaelic word for exactly the same thing. Physicians and alchemists used to think that distilling alcohol was a fundamental element of nature, linking heaven and earth, and that's where we get that contemporary word, spirit. For much of the Middle Ages, aquavit were produced in apothecaries and monasteries and served mostly as medicine. But by the 15th century, drinks called Brantenwein, or burnt wine, began to appear in German texts. Around the same time, winemakers in southwest France began to distill their wine into brandy to ship elsewhere. They'd make things like cognac a little bit afterwards. In Holland, distillers brewed a beer from rye and juniper and then distilled it into a clear spirit called gin. Rum would come from molasses a little bit later in the English West Indies. At first, these were really crude drinks, but they had the advantage of being potent and easy to store and transport without going bad. 
New technological inventions helped to increase the purity of those drinks, particularly the invention of better stills made from things like copper. But for the first time, it became easy for people to drink too much too quickly. Many people before this period lived on beer and wine as a substitute for water that was often unsafe. But distilled liquors didn't really serve that same purpose, and it's this period in the early modern world that widespread alcoholism first became prevalent. Let's build on this just a little bit. Alcohol is a pretty weak drug, all things considered. While some drugs require only milligrams to become potent or have an effect, it takes several grams of alcohol before we even start to feel it. So we can consume it in moderation without harm. But it can be addictive, and consuming large quantities of alcohol can certainly harm us. Alcohol disrupts systems and organs in the body, and then it has other nutritional effects that we don't want. Alcohol looks a little bit like both sugar and fat, and it provides a lot in the way of excess calories to those who drink too much. Those who drink in excess also court really high rates of certain cancers and, of course, accidents. Though by contrast, it seems like drinking a modest amount of alcohol actually has a good protective effect on the body. Having one or two alcoholic drinks a day seems to reduce early deaths from things like heart diseases and strokes, since alcohol raises the level of good HDL cholesterol and lowers the blood factors that might lead to, to strokes and clotting. Wine and beer compounds are particularly strong in those effects, and red wine in particular seems to reduce the body's inflammation reactions, as well as the development of arthritis and certain types of cancer. But the most common effect that people associate with alcohol besides disinhibition is a hangover. A hangover is that feeling the day after drinking of headaches, body aches and nausea, or hypersensitivity to light and sound. A body, while drinking, finds ways to adjust to high concentrations of alcohol, but the morning after it finds itself without the substance that it had the night. The best cures for hangover seem to be to rehydrate the body through liquids, and maybe to take in a little bit of caffeine to tighten the blood vessels in the brain. We'll come back to caffeine in just a few. But for now, try to imagine a world where the one safe substance to drink was something mildly alcoholic. Envision what it would be like to go through your day with small amounts of alcohol constantly in your system. No distilled spirits like vodka or whiskey, but definitely beer or wine in lieu of water. What you're envisioning here is a little bit like how the early modern world must have been, prior to the widespread availability of safe drinking water and stimulating drinks. Everything was disinhibited, rowdy, and maybe just a little bit blurry. So let's talk about stimulants. The rhythms of modern lives are governed by different stimulants. We fuel our workdays, our schooling, and our evenings with substances that help us stay more alert, awake, and open to new input. But some stimulants are more popular than others. Most likely you didn't start this morning by chewing on cot leaves, though some people in Ethiopia certainly did. And the odds are that you don't prepare for a big exam or a job interview by snorting a few lines of cocaine, at least I really hope not. But the odds are very good that today you had some form of caffeine in a substance like coffee, tea, or chocolate. Caffeine is the most widely consumed stimulant in the world. It's an alkaloid that interferes with the signaling system used by many of our body cells, so it stimulates our nervous systems, reduces drowsiness, and quickens our reaction times. It also increases our muscle's energy production, so it can help us a little bit as an athlete or as a worker. Its effects are basically positive, and good on the mood and mental performance in particular. But drink a little too much caffeine and you become restless, nervous, you can't get to sleep. Caffeine's effects are very quick. The chemical hits your bloodstream within about 15 minutes to maybe two hours max, and they're halfway out of your body in just three to seven hours. Our biggest sources of caffeine today are chocolate, tea, and coffee, we won't really talk about the first, but the latter two have distinct intersections with the European world in particular. Let's first talk about tea and then move on to coffee. Tea, of course, comes from a tree called Camilla sinensis, which grows natively in Southeast Asia and China. Long before we made and brewed tea leaves, humans likely chewed its raw leaves for stimulation. By the third century of the Common Era, cultivators were probably boiling its leaves and drying them, and a little bit afterwards, they were being lightly fried before that drying process. All of this led to an infusion or a brew that's bitter and astringent, but basically mild, and it's similar to a lot of teas that are consumed in Asia in particular today. 
In the 17th century, tea cultivators began to notice that teas get a distinctive smell or color when they wilt or are pressed before drying. This led to the development of more strongly flavored teas like oolong. Tea reached Europe during this period, as China began to trade more and more with Russia and Europe. And it was the darker and more complex style of tea that took off there, and particularly in England. Over the course of the 18th century, consumption of tea skyrocketed, going from around 20,000 pounds in 1700 to 20 million pounds by 1800. When you drink black tea today, you're drinking a variety of tea that was developed by Chinese producers in the 1840s to meet Western taste demands. The British generally paid for their tea in opium, but in the 19th century, the Chinese began to resist that as a form of payment in the form of the Opium Wars. And so Britain began planting tea in its own colonies, and of course in India in particular. They developed their own variety of tea that was stronger and darker called Assam tea, while also producing the Chinese variety in Darjeeling, where it became kind of a separate variety. Black tea remains far and away the most popular variety of tea in the world today, though China and Japan still produce and drink a lot more green tea than black tea. As we talked about last time, tea had this side effect of stimulating European demand for sugar. But coffee, in many ways, had the more profound impact upon Europe. The coffee tree or bush comes from Ethiopia, and its small fruits, sometimes called cherries, were probably first eaten directly by members of the Oromo ethnic group, who maybe sometimes brewed it into a tea-like substance. Humans probably figured all this out by watching animals, who were just as stimulated by the leaves and berries themselves. By the 14th century, this plant had arrived in the Middle East, right across the Gulf of Aden. Traders took coffee strains from the Harar region of Ethiopia and began to domesticate it in Yemen. There, the preparation was different. Its seeds were roasted, ground, and infused, and the plant in preparation took on an Arabic word, kava. Yemen was the place where a very particular style of coffee preparation was codified, and this is still how we process coffee beans today. The berries are picked by hand and sorted by color and ripeness. The skin of the berry is removed and the mix is all fermented. The seeds are dried and then finely roasted, and the longer you roast coffee, the darker and more charred it gets, and the more caffeine is lost. So light roasts tend to be much more stimulating than darker roasts. When Arabs made coffee in the early medieval world, they made a really thick preparation that looks a lot like today's Turkish coffee. The beans were powdered and combined with water, sometimes a little bit of sugar, and then boiled until it creates foam several times, before being poured into smaller cups. Coffee was extremely popular, particularly in a world where alcohol was prohibited by Islam, though Muslim clerics went back and forth as to whether or not coffee was actually allowed. In 1511, imams in Mecca banned coffee, but the Ottomans overturned the verdict and it took off throughout the Ottoman Empire. European travelers first encountered coffee in the Ottoman Empire during the 15th century, but they really basically held it in disdain and it didn't take off for another 200 years. It just so happened that the European uptake of coffee came at a moment of revolution, when citizens were looking for new places to socialize and debate new big ideas. We'll come back to that in just a moment, but for now, a word about preparation. The first Europeans to really start drinking coffee were the French, and around 1700, they started to hold the ground coffee in a cloth bag. The result was a clearer brew without sediment. And then, 50 years later, they figured out how to use a drip pot, pouring hot water on the ground into a separate chamber. The result was a modern coffee that was more flavorful and less bitter. This was a beverage really suited to European tastes. Now, coffee began taking hold across Europe. And there was a new space for Europeans to consume coffee, the coffee house. Now we take the coffee house for granted. It's a place you go and get a quick drink, you bring out your laptop and work. But those spaces were very radical for their time. They became the hub of new spaces where people read news, traded ideas, and voiced their opinions on issues in business, the arts, and politics. The spaces that Coffee Hill produced were almost democratic ones. They weren't the house, but they weren't the aristocratic court either. In the 20th century, scholars began to realize that this was really the beginning of a new moment in the way that people related to each other, and they began thinking of coffee houses as the precursor to the modern public sphere. But of course, there was a chemical component to all of this. 
Before coffee houses, people were meeting in ale houses or pubs, drinking beer or wine. Imagine a conversation on an important subject after a few glasses of weak beer, and then one after a couple of cups of really strong coffee. One of those conversations would probably be a little more stimulated, and so stimulants like tea and coffee began to transform Europe. Coffee houses, when they were first introduced to England in the 1650s, were neither entirely innocent nor just for coffee. English coffee houses are strange from the very beginning with many different strong opinions both for and against their existence. Why the contention? First, let's look at the origins. Coffee's association with the Turks, due to its Levant origination, made the foreign import a target for intense suspicion and its acceptance in English society was no foregone conclusion. During the 17th century, the Ottoman Empire was regarded by certain segments of the English population as a harbinger for anti-Christian forces. A frequent symbol that an establishment sold coffee in England was that of the Turk's head, and not an insignificant number of voices expressed concerns about what this symbol truly meant and its ability to undermine the English ways of life. One poet went so far as to suggest that even brewing Turkish coffee with English water would pollute the entire River Thames. Second is the issue of taste. Coffee is bitter, and even those dedicated to defending the virtues of coffee drinking in the 17th century had to admit that hardly anyone liked it the first time they tried it, even if sugar was added. Many contemporary sources, most of them satirical, characterized the taste of coffee in various terrible ways. They called it black, thick, nasty, bitter, stinking, quote, nauseous puddle water. One source in particular simply defines the taste and smell of coffee as like that of soot. And now the problem of taste collides with contemporary understandings of human biology, leading to potentially another barrier getting in the way of a coffee house's success. Caffeine wasn't understood in its chemical composition until the 1820s, and concerns about how coffee potentially affected the body in the 17th century were expressed in multiple ways. One of those was through the language of reproduction. One interpretation of coffee suggested that it could cause barrenness in women and impotency in men by drying up moisture in the body due to its heat and excessive bitterness. Oral investigations launched by Royal Society scholars at Oxford on coffee's virtues did help facilitate its acceptance in the English social fabric going into the 18th century, with some seeing it as a socially acceptable alternative to drinking alcohol because it didn't result in intoxication. However, it was this exact feature that others feared would cause an increase in the consumption of alcohol by allowing a person to continue drinking all day long and periodically curing themselves of the effects of alcohol by drinking coffee. One 1674 broadside, supposedly written by angry wives, bemoans the fact that all of their husbands are drunker than they were before. And like, quote, tennis balls between two rackets, the fops our husbands are bandied to and fro all day between the coffee house and tavern. So, while coffee drinking became a key part of an ethic of respectable behavior shared by both the middling and elite classes through its association with sobriety and civility, eventually being associated with the temperance movement, it clearly did not start off that way for coffee. Yet before 1700, the actual coffee bean itself was not easy to come by because of spotty supply chains. Not even 2% of the English population was able to even drink coffee before 1700. 
So while it was first introduced to Britain in a commercial sense during the 1650s, with the first coffee house being established around 1652, it was still another five decades before coffee house culture maintained any consistent connection with the material good itself. If coffee had all these PR problems because of its origins, bitter taste, and lack of availability, why did coffee houses continue to spring up all around England during the end of the 17th century? Throughout the end of the 17th century, it was increasingly common to find new opportunities and experiences in these coffee houses that had nothing to do with coffee. One could take lessons in French, Latin, dancing, fencing, could listen to lectures on mathematics, poetry, consult a doctor on your back pain, review ancient manuscripts, attend an auction of a recently bankrupt merchant's personal library. All of these experiences helped drown out the voices of detractors. And aside from more formal lesson taking, a coffee house in late 17th century London was a place where one could witness the dissection of a dolphin, the display of an exotic animal, or an exhibition of a child with three penises. In October of 1684, for example, the Bell Savage Inn played host to the first rhinoceros ever brought to England. And prior, in 1675, Thomas Garraway's coffee house was where you could find an Asian elephant. So a taste of the strange and foreign certainly contributed to the popularity element of coffee houses during this era. In addition to the early modern zoo experience, coffee house patrons could depend on hearing the latest news and gossip. And not only did the coffee houses disseminate news, they also manufactured it. What went on in one establishment was frequently found in the newsletter of another. Patrons were expected to pay their penny at the bar on their way home after a night of lively debate, drinking, and gossiping. And it was this practice that became another point of detraction, one that centered on coffee houses as facilitating spaces for libel and sedition due to the associated explosion of news culture. Throughout the 1670s, King Charles II alternatively tried to ban the sale of coffee, ban the sale of printed materials at coffee houses, and tried revoking the licenses of coffee house owners, going so far in 1674 to issue a proclamation declaiming against the practice of spreading false news and, quote, licentious talking of matters of state and government in public. Even under the threat of fines, imprisonment, and death, the trade of news continued to erupt within an unlicensed printing industry, one that was largely operated out of coffee houses. And the following year, the king had to reverse course due to massive public backlash. One scholar notes that it would take the rise of the East India Company and Indian colonies with high taxes on coffee to make Britain the teetotaling country that it became in the 19th century. No one was able to put a damper on coffee drinking, certainly not the king. Overall, a key part of coffee's surging popularity at the end of the 17th century ultimately had more to do with the explosion of print culture, the lure of gossip, the budding world of public intellectuals, and the new commodities and experiences offered at coffee houses. To think through questions of coffee and power just a little bit more, I reached out to someone who knows coffee and knows history equally deeply. Professor Casey Lurtz of Johns Hopkins University is a historian of Mexico in global context, 
and her work explores the links between rural development, world markets, the environment, and economic ideas in the long 19th century. Her first book, From the Grounds Up, Building an Export Economy in Southern Mexico, uses the development of Southern Mexico's coffee economy to explain how Mexican engagement with global markets was shaped by long-lasting local political and social structures. We had a great conversation about coffee and power, and here's some of what she had to say. I'm Casey Lertz. I'm a historian of Latin America. I work at Johns Hopkins University and I work on the history of rural development, how kind of people far from cities, far from places we think as being integrated into the world, into the globe, become part of global systems of exchange and movement and how they influence it, how they are influenced by things that are happening really far from where they live. And in my first book, which is the one about coffee and the one we're going to talk about partly today, which was called From the Grounds Up, Building an Export Economy in Southern Mexico. I looked at how this place that's basically, it's on the border between Guatemala and Mexico, so way down in Southern Mexico, that was basically a bunch of backwater cow towns in the mid-19th century, becomes Mexico's biggest exporter of coffee within about 50 years. So by 1900, 1910. And by looking at coffee there, I'm thinking about all of the ways that these people who previously had been growing corn and beans and maybe some cacao, maybe a little bit of sugar, maybe a little bit of cotton, start growing this thing that they don't really consume coffee because Throughout history, coffee is basically grown by people for somebody else to drink. Most people who grow coffee don't end up drinking it themselves. And most of the coffee in the world is grown for consumption elsewhere. How they start growing this thing and how it lets them, at least in this case, keep a hold of their land, keep a hold of a little bit of autonomy, which is a thing that coffee still can do. It doesn't always do, but you don't need a lot to grow coffee. It doesn't take a ton of money. It doesn't take a ton of inputs. As long as you've got linkages to markets and as long as you know that you're going to have your land, you can end up making a little bit of extra cash growing some coffee. So that's the sum up of the work that was in that book. So coffee as it sounds like your students already have heard, starts in Ethiopia, what is now Ethiopia, moves into Yemen, moves from there throughout the Muslim world first, through the Ottoman Empire, but also into what we, comes to be called the East Indies through the colonial process and is very much a product of colonialism by the 16th, 17th century. By the time it gets into Europe, it is moving out of solely the hands of Islamic trade networks and into European colonial trade networks. And European colonial powers are increasingly taking over the land and controlling the process of coffee production, first in Southeast Asia. And then once the Americas come into the colonial circuit, bringing coffee by way of a, a botanical garden in Amsterdam through the French and then into the French Caribbean first. And so what's now Haiti, what's then Saint-Domingue is the first place in the Americas that coffee is grown. Saint-Domingue had been the primary exporter from the Americas of coffee to Europe. But elites throughout, first Brazil is the big one, and then eventually in other parts of Latin America start seeing an opportunity to take over that part of the market that what is now Haiti has lost by dint of being declared Black Republic that folks in Europe, monarchists in Europe, don't want to trade with anymore. And so in Brazil, where they also have a ton of land and a ton of enslaved labor able to put into work doing this, they start growing coffee there. And to that point, so to the early 19th century, coffee is, think of it part of the spice trade. It's like super luxury. It's something that if you're elite, if you have money, you can drink maybe in your house, maybe in a coffee shop, but it's not something that everybody's drinking every morning. By 1860s, every soldier in the U.S. Army expects to be given a ration of coffee. So like it's part of it over 50 years, very much on the backs of enslaved labor in Brazil. And for it to happen that quickly is amazing and horrendous when you think about how that came about. At the same time, though, the people who are running the armies and running the factories want something of their own to drink, too, and don't necessarily want to be drinking the same thing that the people they're employing drink. And so they start investing in nicer coffees, fancier things, more luxurious, recreating the luxury market around coffee. And that's the coffee that I end up looking at in large part. And that's the coffee that starts being grown first in Costa Rica and then throughout Central America, as well as in Colombia and Venezuela. And some of that is still mass market coffee, but Brazilian coffee continues to be, and, and in that moment, mid-19th century is the coffee of the masses. 
and these other Latin American coffees start being the more expensive, considered to be better tasting. And this is all culturally constructed in a lot of ways. They're more expensive because there's less enslaved labor involved, but they're also just constructed to be nicer, better, more elite beverages. One of the things that's also important to know about coffee is that it takes four years from when you plant the plant for you would, to get any sort of harvest out of it. And then you've got a couple decades generally to keep harvesting beans from the plant. But that need to know that the land that you plant the coffee on is going to be yours four years later is something that's really important when it comes to how coffee spreads across um, Latin America in the 19th century. But then also when we look at like the return to coffee in places like Ethiopia or other kind of post-colonial parts of Africa and coffee has become really a development crop because like I said earlier, you don't need that much money to make it work as long as you've got connections to market, but you do need to know that you have that piece of land. And so private property, or at least some reliable system of land management and land tenure, whereby again, that land is going to be yours. And so coffee plants, once they're at the stage where they can be harvested from, they bloom a couple times. It's a weird botanical thing. Rather than just all blooming at once, they have a couple different moments when they bloom. There's cycles of it. And so you'll have one bush, the flowers are white, they're beautiful, they smell really wonderful. And then a couple months later, it starts fruiting. And the fruit is called a cherry. And they're like little tiny, initially green fruits. They look not exactly like cherries, but imagine very small plums or something like that, that grow in clusters, but they don't all ripen at the same time, even on one branch. It won't be that all of them are green and then they get darker and darker and then they turn this bright red when they're ripe. It'll be that like each branch, different beans are ripening at different times. And so this is where the labor part of it comes into things. You can either let everything ripen on the bush and then it starts to ferment in the fruit and you end up with a lot of different flavors within each different bean, within each different branch because things have ripened and then fermented and dried out at different rates. And so you get a really mixed bag of what things end up tasting. Or you can have enough people working for you that they go through and pick just the ripe, the bright red cherries as they are ripe. And then they get processed right away. Either they're allowed to dry with that fruit still around them, or they get processed, wet processed, it's called, and that fruit is immediately washed off of the bean. And so the bean dries out absent that fruit around it. And those lead to different kinds of flavors. And the, the first one is called natural processing, and it's had a moment in specialty coffees. But those different processes cost different amounts of money, rely, require different kinds of labor inputs, and then lead to different sorts of flavors also, and different kinds of gradations coming out of that also on the other end. And again, like you can do this all by hand. You can do the drying process that comes next on big patios out in the sun, or you can do it in machines that kind of tumble dry everything. Similarly with the packaging and the sorting and all of this sort of stuff, it can either be done on a real small scale by hand without much mechanical input, or you can mechanize much of this process aside from the actual picking of the beans itself. Unless you're like going to the farmer's market on the, a weekly basis and only eating from the farmer's market, mostly you are engaging with very large scale production and thinking about companies, corporate interests that employ a lot of people, maybe subcontract with a lot of small farmers, but generally the way we consume is based on really large scale production. And what I'm trying to argue is that all those subcontractors, all of the kind of people around the edges who start producing these goods as well, who find ways to grow them or work on these farms or work on these plantations, we also need to pay attention to because they also shape the activities of those corporate interests, of those bigger plantations, whether we call them peasant producers, whether they're laborers, whether they're smallholders, whether they're communities that are growing these goods, they put constraints on the ways that corporate actors and the ways that plantations can operate. And even if they don't have a great deal of and if political influence at a national level in terms of capital don't have a lot to bring to the table, they still in their physical selves, in the ways that they use the land, in the ways that they are and aren't willing to work, make, make some space for themselves in shaping what this kind of production that ends up on our plates or in our cups looks like. And the other thing to think about with this is that all of these folks, whether or not they have a huge range of choices for what they're doing, 
they are selecting in often to the growth of some of these goods so that there are ways in which we need to think about kind of the choices that people who we don't always think of as having choices to make are making about how they spend their tiny bit of money, how they apportion their little piece of land and think about the ways that them choosing in this case to grow a little bit of coffee does in fact add up because there are a lot of these people, a lot more of these people than there are corporations. And even if proportionally they're not producing as much, they still have a big role to play in shaping the overall nature of these different markets and these different modes of production that we're talking about. I actually don't drink a ton of coffee. It's weird. And it's not for moral reasons. And it's not for things that I discovered during my research. It's just that uh, it makes me super jittery. And I'm already an anxious person. And I don't need that added boost most of the time. I like coffee. I drink it occasionally. And I try and drink it responsibly, ethically, when possible, in part because of spending time down there, in part because that's increasingly how I try and approach my consumption. In writing this book and doing the research behind it and increasingly trying to do more stuff around coffee with small coffee houses, with small coffee roasters, it's made me increasingly aware of the lack of transparency that is there in most of the ways that we drink coffee and where it's really hard to figure out where that, if you're buying specialty coffee, where that $16 that you're spending on a bag of coffee or that $5 that you're spending on a latte in a coffee shop, who's actually getting that money and very little of it, even in fair trade is actually making it back to the people who are growing the coffee. Coffee is, as a commodity is really fascinating. It's after petroleum products, the most traded thing in the world. But unlike petroleum products or sugar or cotton, there's no scientific measure that dictates the value of coffee. It's all about taste. It's all about what we decide that we like or what somebody else decides for us that we like and wants to sell us. So it's all about taste, which is, again, very culturally constructed, very much about what you grow up with, what you're introduced to, when you're introduced to it, what context you're introduced to it in, how much time you spend with it, all of this sort of thing. Good coffee is so subjective and is so based on what you yourself like, and you should feel fine with that. I drink milk in my coffee. If you put a lot of sugar in it, whatever, it's fine. That's a personal taste thing. But the ethical part of things is increasingly... There are more places that are trying to be transparent about it, but it's also can be really hard to figure out if what you care about with regards to the ethics of what you're consuming is actually being followed through on. Historically, globally, Americans have access to very cheap food. And so it feels really uncomfortable to spend money on things like this. But if you have the resources to looking into who is willing to tell you what their relationships are with the people who are actually planting and growing the coffee, what those places that are growing the coffee look like in terms of the employment that they're engaged in, in terms of kind of the, the sustainability environmentally of what they're doing, and then being willing to pay that bit extra as long as you can try and know that it's going back, at least some of that extra cost is going back to the people who are actually growing the coffee is the way that I try and approach it now. I am not always successful. I'm at my in-laws. So there's definitely some Starbucks coffee in the cupboard right now, but it's also made me feel okay about not drinking as much coffee because when I do, I want it to be good coffee and coffee that I feel good about. I would encourage people, I know that like counterculture coffees, a lot of coffee shops now, third wave, fourth wave coffee shops, offer what are called cuppings. And it's a cupping is a tasting. It's the way that the people who are buying beans decide what beans they want to buy. Folks who actually work in the coffee world learn how to do this. It's like wine tasting. And you have different notes that you point out. If you see those like tasting notes on your bag of coffee, this is coming out of this practice. And you can go learn how to do it. And most places offer this for free. A lot of it is directed towards baristas, towards people who are working in that world, but it's also open to customers generally. And you get to taste some coffee. You get to learn what these different words mean. One of them that I went to, they brewed the same coffee that we tasted various times, but they brewed it different ways each time. So you could also find out what was the difference between just your coffee pot versus a pour over versus an espresso versus a different style of pour over. These are all these things that you see as options at a fancy coffee place. What do they actually do to the bean? And it's amazing how different it tasted in these different ways. So there are ways that you, if you're interested in getting beyond whatever it is you drink right now, can go and educate yourself. And as with anything taste-wise, it's like the more you taste, the better. And if you're buying cups of coffee, that gets really expensive. But if you can find these ways to engage with the educational aspect of coffee shops and roasters, that's another way to get into it and, and see some more things from different angles. And you may end up hating it all and going back to drinking it however you 
consumed it initially, but you may find that at least in certain circumstances or in certain ways, you're interested in trying these other things and maybe pointedly ask a few questions about sourcing and <laughs> all of that. But you can at least get some more of the like, where is the actual flavor coming from? What are these flavors that you're going to encounter? And do you like them, in fact? We've covered a ton of ground today. We outlined the different ways that humans use substances to alter the way their mind works. And we saw how the fermentation of sugar into alcohol as wine, beer, or distilled spirits is one of the great human achievements, but also the site of a lot of social peril, particularly after the development of stronger alcoholic drinks. And we saw how the rise in consumption of new caffeine-based stimulants, mainly coffee and tea, though we also could have mentioned chocolate, helped fuel big developments in political culture throughout Europe and later the world. Next time, we're gonna build on questions of political culture and talk about hunger, how political thinkers and regimes in the early modern world dealt with newly important questions of scarcity and famine as global food supplies began to rise. We'll pick that up next time. See you then.